Okay, I'm going to go through this really quickly. Um, this is essentially catching up on something that I should have done last week. So I um, went ahead and did the uh, recording for the first regular expression um, uh, webinar. Um, I'll do the second part focusing primarily on uh, mark edit, but I forgot during the process of doing it to record it and hadn't realized until I was about halfway through. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through um, the slides um, probably a lot faster than I did it during the session. Um, I'll go through some examples. Um, there are examples in the slides, but they're um, really just meant to be simple examples. Uh, I have other examples that will show on the, the screen. Um, the focus of this particular session it was really to be more of a, a really quick primer. Um, hard to do this. Uh, in fact, I've been kind of wanting to put this off. Um, usually when I talk about regular expression, do it over the course of a day or two. So this is going to be really brief. Um, I'm going to basically cover some topics really quickly. Um, the part two is going to be focused more on which of these expression pieces uh, show up most often in mark edit and then probably go over some examples or will go over some examples real life examples of how it gets applied uh, within the application so this is really just to get folks familiar with the, uh, the language um, or at least parts of the language in terms of how net which is what mark edit is written in um, provides regular expression, the, what the regular expression language looks like, because it is different um, than, uh, than other expression languages and, and some fine parts. So uh, the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to not um, take up the entire screen uh, with the slides, partly because what we're going to do is I have a sample record and we're going to run that inside of a testing um, web page that I'm going to recommend folks using. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So there are two particular pieces of document, two particular websites that I recommend for people to um, use when they're working with .NET uh, regular expressions. The first one is uh, the language reference. I already have that set up here. This is the reference for um, uh, the quick reference, the .NET language that uh, Microsoft provides. Um, I actually keep this file uh, printed out. It's a, um, a quick reference to the uh, .NET framework. It's PDF. I really like it because it gives me a quick overview of um, some of the, the grouping um, mechanisms, so particularly negative look ahead and behind um, that I don't use all the time uh, that I might want to refresh my memory on. Um, as well as some of the escapes that are present um, in the, the language. Uh, but it gives you a really quick um, uh, helping helper uh, file um, that uh, is easy to print, put somewhere. Uh, so the quick reference, which covers everything that we're going to talk about here in addition to some more stuff. So um, there's that. Uh, the second one is this page here. It's a uh, uh, regexstorm.net. So it's actually pretty hard uh, to find um, a resource that does uh, .NET regular expressions. And so Mark Edit um, does do .NET regular expressions. But a lot of times I find when I start working with them within records that it's better to have a place for me to test without having to do it in real time. So I'll grab a couple of test records, throw them into this input thing, and then use the uh, pattern tester so that I can see how the expressions are being um, applied. A couple caveats. Um, I found that um, in the regular expression language, uh, particularly as tester, that testing for end of lines doesn't work particularly well. Um, so if I have an expression that's going to cross records or cross lines, uh, like in a multi-line replacement, I'm going to have to actually do that in real time. This particular tool doesn't uh, doesn't work as well for that. Um, but what it does do is it allows me to set options. So mark edits, traditional options um, look essentially uh, like this, single line and uh, culture invariant. Culture invariant is an important distinction to be able to understand. So um, within the .NET framework, uh, all stream processing functions are culturally aware. 
uh, by default, they um, default to your um, current uh, language slash cultural pack that's within the, uh, the, the operating system. What this does is it helps the application understand what are numbers and letters um, by applying a culturally invariant um, uh, uh, set of options. What the tool does is it allows it to um, uh, capture both um, letters and characters, uh, word, let, word characters um, and non-word characters uh, across languages. So if I want to capture, uh, if I want to match on anything that's not a um, number and I want that to be true for um, every language, I can use the culturally invariant option, um, use a shortcut um, to uh, substitution shortcut uh, to represent um, not a digit uh, and have the tool capture um, those not digit characters across the different language platforms rather than just for either English or a Latin a base language or something like that. So that's actually pretty useful to know. Um, and so MarkEdit um, works that way. This allows you to, to, to check those options. Generally, um, for a lot of stuff that I'm doing, it doesn't matter. So I'm gonna leave those unchecked just so that we can play around with the examples. So I'm gonna go ahead and move this over here and move this over here and we're just going to go and go through the slides. All right, so a couple things. So what are regular expressions? So I'll make this a little bigger. So regular expressions will look um, like this, maybe not like this as complicated, but they basically look like a lot of um, symbols thrown together um, and then somehow they end up meaning something when the tool uh, or some tool processes them um, and makes meaning out of them. And that's essentially what we have, regular expressions to, to some degree are like a language. They're not like a, a programming language in the sense that you have, um, well, they do kind of have variables, but and and but, but not in the same way as, as a lot of programming languages, but they are, do allow you to do a lot of things that are interesting um, and allow you to do very fine um, replacements as well as do replacements that have conditionality attached to them. So I'm gonna go through the language elements um, to the .NET regular expression. Uh, tool. Um, their slides have some samples. We're just going to skip those mostly. Um, we're going to work within the um, regular expression tester because uh, that's how I'd like to do it. Uh, but the slides will be there in case one of the people want to look at them later. All right, so the first thing we have to look at are literal characters. And literal characters are basically just a, uh, basically what a character, however character is written, that's what it is. Um, so, um, for example, in our, our sample over here, um, any of these characters that are written out, these are literal characters. And if I want to find them within a regular expression, I just start typing and the tool will match. A regular expression acts like an in string match, a regular find uh, match, um, looking for that um, uh, literal character. There are some special characters. We're going to talk about those in a minute. Those are characters that will not process as a literal and they have to then be escaped or do something special to them in order for them to be found. But by and large, uh, most characters fall under the literal category. So if I wanted to look for um, this value here in the 245, um, if I start typing it, um, I'm gonna go ahead and match it. Literal characters. Literals are gonna match um, either whole words, middle words, they will match cross words. So um, type in A, find all the A's that are in there. That's what's different um, uh, to some degree with regular expressions. Um, <clears throat> literal characters are also case sensitive unless they've been told not to be. So this goes back to options. So here I have a case sensitive. So if I'm looking for um, the title in the uh, 245 and I type in L-A-N-G-U-V-S, it's not going to find it because um, there's capital there unless I have applied an option that makes case um, ignored. And you can set ignore case options in MarkEdit. By default, they are not set up that way. Uh, MarkEdit does not ignore case. Um, because that's not a good idea um, to ignore case for the, the most part. 
um, especially when doing um, replacements unless I specifically want to. So Mark Edit doesn't turn that on by default, but again, if you go back to the handy dandy language reference um, and you check uh, through the, um, the PDF, you'll find one of the constructs, constructs that are there um, is the, let's see, find it here, the, the very end here, where we can actually set um, options that override the patterns that are found within um, the, uh, the, the default uh, set. So for example, if I didn't want to check this option, I could continue to apply a, um, uh, a uh, apply those options through this structure by using the uh, parentheses question mark um, and then whatever one of these options you want to apply. So, so case insensitivity is going to be um, the I. So I could make this value case insensitive. Um, I read that already. Uh, yeah, I should be able to make that case insensitive by disabling, putting the I, where was it? It was Question mark. I think it's a dash to turn it off. I don't do this part very often. Um, anyways, I'd have to read it, uh, but it's there, so you can figure out. Look at the examples, um, so you can set those values in the say, case sensitivity. All right, back to this here. But case sensitivity is is applied within Mark Edit by default. So if you're searching for literals and you wanted to find um, words like language um, and you wanted it to be um, upper or lower case and you actually wanted to target one particular value this is where we get into and we'll see it in a minute um, using uh, grouping constructs um, to set ranges of characters that are allowed <clears throat> so special characters so these are characters that have special meanings so i'm showing you two here these brackets, brackets are special characters. They tell uh, the regular expression language that you're looking for um, either a range or group of ranges, or you're not looking for a specific uh, character within that range. Um, and that means that they have to be looked at differently. So if I was looking for um, a character that is a special character, I have to approach it uh, in a special way. So you'll see dollar sign. A dollar sign is in the characters that's special. So that's problematic to some degree in the mnemonic language that's, that Mark Eddy uses. Um, it's a special character. So I can't just do dollar sign A and find all of the subfield A's because the, the dollar sign represents a special character. So in order to find those, we have to escape them. We have to tell the operating, tell the regular expression that we actually mean for this to be a dollar sign. And in that case, we have to use another special character. So this character here, this slash, is a character that's used to represent either a substitution um, uh, that's designed a kind of a shortcut to stand in for a range of characters or a special character or it's used to escape character, to make a special character, a special, a, a, a literal. So in this case, I put that slash in front and then a dollar sign. And I've told the regular expression that um, I am escaping this character. So I wanna treat the dollar sign as a dollar sign, not as its special character equivalent. And what is the dollar sign special character equivalent? Well, the dollar sign special character equivalent has lots of meanings. Um, but particularly within the regular expression um, language, it has, uh, especially in the, the search uh, part of it, um, a dollar sign tends to stand in most often for um, end of a line. So where the uh, new line characters show up. So in Mark Edit, if I was to put a dollar sign somewhere, you would see the last characters at the end of the line. Unfortunately, within this testing in environment, it doesn't work that way. Um, but in Mark Edit, if I was looking, say, for example, um, 
any fields that ended in a three, I could um, write the expression looking something like this, and it would find all of the fields that ended in a three. Um, so uh, that's how these uh, special characters work. So again, just uh, explaining how special characters, blah, 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 blah. All right. So there are some non-printable characters, characters that no matter, um, uh, they just, they can't be printed um, and so as, a, as an expression. And so they have characters that stand in for them, literals that stand in for them. So a tab, a slash a backspace T, stands in for a tab character. By and large, there should never be tab characters inside of a mark record. Mark edit will remove those automatically during the transformation stage. But if you have a, a, an application that um, puts them in, or you have a tool that, uh, that has embedded them into the application, uh, mnemonic format, you can use a slash T to represent those characters and replace them and get rid of them. Uh, slash R slash N stand for carriage return line feed. Um, depending on the operating system you're working with, the end of line character is going to be a combination of those two or it's going to be individual characters. So in the control that Mark Edit uses to um, edit text on Windows, the character that will end a line is going to be a, a character turn and, an, and another line, a normal line feed. Um, Windows uses uh, what looks like um, the old typewriters format. Uh, on a Mac system, a Mac OS system, uh, the control that Mark Edit uses, um, uses a carriage return at the end of the line. So there is no new line feed. There's just a carriage return at the end of the line. And on a Linux system, um, the character at the end of the control that Mark Edit uses is a new line. And so if you're doing a regular expression that goes between lines and you use the replace function and the multi-line tool, you may be needing to write an expression that looks for the presence or um, accommodates different types of line endings. Um, and so they'll, we'll show you how, I'll show you how that works um, a little bit further down. All right. Um, Period is a special character. Um, it's regular in the regular expressions. It doesn't stand for a period. A period matches any character. So um, I want to catch um, something. O C period L C. Um, that period stands for anything. So it's going to match O C O L C O C A L C. So that period is stands for um, uh, is a uh, special character. We have character classes. That was what I had showed a minute ago, and that's where we can create um, groups of characters. So anything inside the brackets is considered characters that it's looking for. So we can use um, uh, character classes. So we could say uh, um, uh, OC, LC. So matches on both uh, upper and lower case O in the middle. Um, we can do um, uh, something more uh, generic, or maybe we're looking for a date, 2020 or 2010 through 2019. Um, and the tool uses what's inside the brackets. If there's a hyphen in there, it treats it as a range. So in this case, um, it's looking for anything between zero and nine. If I wanted just zero and nine, then I could do that. Um, so the, if I want uh, A through Z, that's gonna be everything lowercase A through Z, A through Z, A through Z, lowercase and uppercase. Um, so that hyphen uh, stands in for a range inside of the bracketed characters. That's what it shows there. Um, we can also look for not matches. So let's say I wanted to find everything but not 2019. I can use the caret, which inside the brackets stands for um, uh, does not match, when outside the bracket means starts of line, start of a line. So does not match uh, nine. So now it's going to look for anything that's 2000. 
0 through 18, but it won't match 2019. Maybe I want to match everything that does not match 0 through 8. So that's going to just match 2019. Um, so that negating uh, match can match either within a range or within a set of um, uh, individual characters that are put inside of the brackets. Um, but that negation stands for everything inside of the space. Inside the brackets are special. Um, so where we have special characters, um, like the dollar sign and those, um, those characters aren't special inside of the brackets. Within the brackets, there are only specific characters that are special, and that's going to be the caret because it has special meaning, um, the uh, dash because it has special meaning, um, the closing and open brackets because those have special meaning, as well as the backslash because, again, in order to find a caret, I have to be able to use a backslash to negate um, the special characterness of that character. So if I wanted to find a dollar sign, I can find a dollar sign just by using um, the brackets because it'll treat it as a, uh, a literal within the brackets. Um, just talked about that. All right, shorthand. You'll see a lot of shorthand um, in the expressions that I write on the list. It's because I like to use them because they are culturally invariant. I talked about cultural variance earlier. So if I'm looking for numbers um, and I'm looking for any digit uh, slash D, so now it's going to find any digit, by default, the tool uh, by default, regular expression languages in .NET default to whatever your, um, your language is that you're using in your system. So um, if the default language was Arabic, then slash D would um, shorthand to Arabic digits. Um, if you were using um, uh, English like I am, then slash D corresponds to um, the English uh, Latin digits. If I want it to be culturally invariant, um, and I don't care whether they're digits in one language or another, um, I use the culturally invariant um, option, and then slash D stands in for any digit. So that's why markedit approaches regular expressions as being culturally invariant. So that way these shorthand character classes can be used to expand beyond the language that's being used on your local machine, partly because we use so many, we do so much metadata work that's um, language uh, spans multiple languages. But these are also really useful. So slash D stands for any uh, digit, slash W stands for any word um, or word character, um, uh, slash S for any white space. There are also the inverse, uh, slash capital D for any non-word, non-digit, uh, slash W for any non-word character, uh, slash S for any non-space character. These are really handy. Say, for example, if you needed to, to put a period at the end of a, a line that doesn't have one, uh, you can look specifically for characters like this. Um, say I was looking for a line, I could say, uh, let's say I was looking um, uh, at a particular um, field. So I'm gonna say, I wanted to, to put a period on the end of the 600 field. Um, and this won't find it, but just uh, uh, so I can show you the expression, um, I could do 600.4 uh, to cover my first part, uh, dot star, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to do slash w because I'm going to say any non-word character um, at the end of the line. And so this doesn't match it because end of line characters are kind of wonky within this example, but what this regular expression does, it says, okay, match this first part so I know I'm just looking at the 600 field capture everything else in the line until we get to the last character in the line and only match um, if that character um, is a non-word. Um, so in this case, it would only match if the line ended in a period. So it shouldn't match that one. So let me do, oops. So that would only match if it ends in a word. So in this case, if I wanted to find the, uh, the lines that didn't have a period in them, that would um, find um, what I'm looking for. I could also use the negate. 
any line, any line um, that does not have a non-word character at the end. So different ways to write the same expression using different approaches. Um, so uh, repetition, so essentially we're starting to talk about greediness. So um, asterisks uh, basically are zero to uh, no match, uh, zero matches to many matches. Pluses are one to many matches. A question mark is a, a, a one, a zero to one match. Um, so we have different ways to, to basically um, match lots of data. So let's say um, we wanted to match on the 490 and then we wanted to catch um, all of the data. So that takes the entire line. Um, some of the data, actually we'll go ahead and go, um, let's do the different ways that this works. So equals 490, um, let's say we're looking at a, a space. We're gonna say space uh, zero or multiple times. So it matches the same thing. If we use a plus, it's, it's uh, one to many matches. If we use a question mark, you see it takes one off because it's only a zero or one match. Um, so we have different approaches to greediness. Um, and where this gets really useful um, and really important is when we're finding uh, matches, say, within subfields. So let's say we only want to catch the subfield data that's right here. Well, uh, or actually yeah, right here, we only want what's in the subfield A. Well, it's actually pretty difficult to do that in some respects because if we do 490, dot four, so we capture everything up to the indicator, and then we say we want to catch subfield A, and then we take everything, and then dot star. Well, really, what we've done, because of the way regular expressions work, is it's going to keep fulfilling the part of the equation until uh, it can't. Well, because I've got dot star here, it's going to take all of it. There is no stopping at the dollar sign V, and if we look at the results in the table here that show um, how things are broken down, we see that that in the expression here, dollar sign one, which is represented the first group, um, we get the first part of the match. Dollar sign two takes the rest of the field and dollar sign three is empty because this doesn't match anything. This is where we have to start thinking about greediness um, and how we put boundaries on the searches. So in this case, let's say I did want to stop at um, the next subfield what I actually am asking is I want to match everything until it gets to a dollar sign. And so I'm actually going to put stops on it. So I'm going to say, as long as it doesn't match dollar sign, then go ahead and match. And now what I've done is I've created a stopping point. So the tool now knows that when it reaches the next dollar sign, that's where it needs to stop. And so now we do have value that's matched here. Um, so we end up creating these kind of, we have to think about, um, how we would approach um, searching for content and when we decide to either be lazy or greedy or have uh, what we call eager matches, um, how the application, how the regular expression language is going to um, fulfill that response. When we use things like pluses and asterisks, you tell the regular expression that you want to be especially greedy in terms of how you're matching content and then the regular expression will use what's called eagerness, which is essentially it's going to keep matching until it runs, until it finishes. And so it's not going to work the way that you might think that it does. Um, and that's just something that you have to kind of sort through with experience. So repetition, repetition, repetition. Um, anchors, uh, I had mentioned anchors. Um, uh, they're hard to expand, they're hard to do here. Um, essentially, uh, the, ask, the, the little carrot stands for the beginning of a string, dollar sign stands for the end of the string. There are substitutions for that. Um, uh, those anchors, uh, the slash uh, uppercase A slash uppercase Z are shorthand character classes that do the same thing. Um, a lot of people would wonder why would you use two characters to represent the same thing as one character. The reason I do it is for um, readability. Uh, because the uh, carrot and the dollar sign can be used for so many different things within 
a uh, regular expression. In fact, if we look right here, I've already used them inside of a group of character classes for something else. Um, it actually becomes harder to read the expression, um, sometimes using uh, the carrot and the dollar sign because they show up often um, in lots of different contexts. And so the slash, the backslash dollar, so the slash, backslash A and the backslash Z, even though they are representing, even though they're two characters compared to one, uh, when you see those at the beginning and the end of uh, statements, they stand in um, uh, and stand out in a way that the, um, the carrot and the dollar sign don't. Word boundaries, uh, basically they decide where um, uh, a match would end. So a match has to happen within word boundaries. So you can set a match to happen either at the start of a word or end of a word. Um, I'm gonna have some examples and Mark edit on how that works, but there's um, examples here on the slides. Um, alteration, I think of these as ors. Um, they're not true or statements, but they work uh, for all intents and purposes for what we care about. They, they are essentially like or statements. And what this does is this allows us to um, match on uh, multiple things. So let's say um, in the 041, I was looking to match on uh, French. Um, let me make a couple of these. Uh, so let's say here we've created multiple 041s and we want to match on French and English and German. And um, then I'm going to say, and I'm not sure that's the actual real one, but I'm going to type that in. So let's say I only wanted to match on, um, uh, and then I'm going to put on this one. I'm going to misspell that one. Um, so that way we can uh, do some different things. All right, so let's say we wanted to match on any 041 that included uh, French, English, German. So I can use alteration to match on those values. Um, so we can say equals 041, um, and I'm gonna talk to you about what these little squiggly lines and four mean, um, uh, slash dollar sign A. And then what I'm gonna do is I wanna match on um, either RFRE, ENG, um, And so now, um, whoops. Now what I've done is I've created um, uh, an alteration, so essentially an OR, where it's going to match either on one of these three values, um, and uh, provide me now with the opportunity to, to meet them. So this is actually one of those things that's interesting. So um, the tool uh, uh, can do um, what we call um, eager matching. So uh, decide on when uh, to to match based on until the criteria gets met. Um, so, for example, let's say uh, I had um, uh, something like uh, uh, free free. The tool would match on on uh, the first one, but not the second, because the uh, the um, the value has been met here. So it's not going to match on the second one. Let's say we wanted to include the FRA. Um, again, we can include character classes to um, within our alteration so that we can match on uh, multiple values. So we get to do um, stuff like that that allows us to do this. Now, this is actually an interesting example because what this does is this lets us see in the table um, how the tool matches. So in my case here, because these are all in the same spot, these all stand in in the same group on the table. So if I was going to do a replacement, dollar sign three would stand in for the group that's been matched. But let's say um, I wanted, I had to include these in the dollar sign A. So I wanted to do um, something uh, like this because I can do some matches inside of my tool. So I still match the same thing. But if I look at my table, uh, my table uh, starts to probably look a little bit different. Uh, let's see here, one, two, oh, so one, two, three, I guess it doesn't look any different. I'm gonna show you some, some that do look different here shortly because I'm gonna need to do it for regular expression. So anyways, alterization, we're gonna do it for a named group because the named groups are actually um, really useful for doing things like um, matching on things like uh, 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 
uh, multiple matches where maybe we needed to, like maybe we're gonna do something different depending on if a match is French or if a match is English or matches German. Blah, 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 blah. Eagerness, we talked about that. Laziness, blah, blah. Okay, repetition. So um, you'll see that when I'm writing these expressions, I'm doing things like 041, and then I'm saying period, any character, and four. Um, and what that does is that matches um, the first, it, the next four characters after the end of the one, one, two, three, four. And it's limiting it to four. The reason I do that is a lot of times um, when I'm doing a regular expression, I know that mark edit's mnemonic format has two characters, two spaces following the field number, and then two indicators. And if I don't care about the indicator values, I'm going to say, take the field number and then take all of the data that follows it. And so I'm using four to limit the number of any characters I'm capturing after that. Uh, the uh, regular expression language um, allows you to say at least one match to four matches or one match to infinity or up to uh, four matches, zero to four matches. So you can set limits in terms of how the, the, uh, the, the expression matches and you can see the different ones here. Um, and how you limit those repetitions. We're going to talk about back references somewhere else because um, they tomorrow in the next session because I'd like to be able to show them with real data. Um, name groups. Name groups is actually uh, useful. There are a couple different ways to name a group within the .NET language um, and I'm going to show you why you would do it. So let's say you wanted to actually change indicator values. So in that case, let's say um, we're doing uh, equals 041. Um, and we're going to capture uh, the two spaces and then we're going to take the first indicator, the second indicator, and then everything that follows. So it's matching the entire field. Um, if we look at the table of how these are get broken up, we see dollar sign one, dollar sign two, dollar sign three, dollar sign four. And what do I mean when I say dollar signs? When you're using replacements um, and you're putting the regular expression data back, each one of these dollar signs uh, groups stands in for um, one of these captured group elements. So if I type in uh, dollar sign one, that tells Mark Edit that the replacement, so this is the string it matched, the replacement that gets written back down is just equals 041 and the two spaces. So each one of these groups stands in for something. So let's say I wanted to change the first indicator to two. So I type in dollar sign one to take everything captured in the first group. I type in two. And then I type in uh, dollar sign uh, three and four. So uh, you would think that, that what I'm going to see in the replacement is equals 041, two spaces, a two, and then the second indicator, and then everything that follows. What we actually see in the replacement is we see dollar sign 12, the indicator, and then those values. And that's because what's happening is inside of the regular expression after a dollar sign in the replacement structure, if it sees a number, it believes that that number is a group and it's going to treat the entire number as a group. So it doesn't see dollar sign one, it sees dollar sign 12. So it's looking for the 12th group in the match. There is not, there are not 12 groups in this match. So it blinks, it treats it as a literal dollar sign 12 because there aren't a 12th group. Um, so if I want to actually print out um, this first group, I have to do two things. I either have to treat it as what I consider like an associative array, or I have to name the group. Um, this is the way you would do that. You put these uh, squiggly brackets around um, the, uh, the, the one, and now it treats it almost like an associative array. So now dollar sign one gets treated as group one, and you can see in the replacement that we get to see the value gets replaced. The other option is to name the group. And so you can name the group matching. So I'm going to go ahead and name the group. So we can name the group. And now the, the, the way that the table looks is very different. I, learned, I like to point this out because now dollars, the, the group one, group two, group three have shifted because I have a named group. So this first group that's named no longer counts within the group numbers. You can't match it that way anymore. Um, so group one now is uh, indicator uh, one, group two is now indicator two, and group three is now the rest of the field. 
and the named group, group one, is the beginning of the field. So in order to represent the data at the beginning of the field, I have to use the named group, and then I have to remember that all of my group numbers now have shifted. And so now group two is going to be the second indicator, and group three is going to be the rest of the field. And when I look at the replacement here, you see that it's put in pro appropriately. <clears throat> All right, let's go over here. Okay, that's the end of my, my thing. Uh, so name groups is the last thing I want to talk about. Name groups are uh, show up all over inside of the uh, the mark edit um, regular expression language although often you will see most expressions um, using uh, the structure that uses the um, where I use more of the associative structure where we use one something more like that um, where we use the, the squirrely brackets and then the number of the group um, uh, for most of the expressions that show up in there. Um, why else would you name a group? Well, sometimes you want to name a group if you're going to have sub-expressions. Sub um, so I had mentioned, um, uh, say you wanted your expression to be something like this, 041.4, um, and then we have a first group that opens stuff up, so dollar sign A, and then we have a second group that maybe is F-E-F-R-E -E, um, or uh, F-R-A or uh, G-R-E-R. -E so those all uh, potentially match um, in different contexts, um, but uh, what I have a difficult time knowing though is which group is showing up in the replacement table. So if we look at the replacement table, we see that each one of those groups becomes a group. Um, and so the way to solve that problem um, is to name your elements. So let's say I wanted this to be, I was going to work within the subfield A so that I want the top level element because I'm going to replace the values no matter what I find um, in this space. Um, I could name that group. And now, um, depending on how things match, um, I could uh, capture any of the data um, that there, that's there that follows. Um, so maybe I want it to look more like that. So now um, group one stands in for every one of those matches instead of having to alliterate through the different groups that are there. So that's really handy um, when thinking about uh, doing um, kind of those, those ORD alliterative style matches. So that's the stuff I'm going to talk about. Like I said, a little bit more compressed than uh, the, uh, the one I did last week. Um, obviously missing questions, unfortunately. Uh, sorry about not recording it. Slides are in the, the slides will be on SlideShare like normal, reference from the uh, description. Um, for the next session, uh, the part two, um, the approach that I'm taking is that part two will be all about doing regular expressions inside of MarkEdit. Uh, particularly taking um, the broad parts of the regular expression language and condensing it down to the handful of elements that are going to show up in probably 90% of the regular expressions that you use. And then talking about how regular expressions get applied within MarkEdit, because in MarkEdit it's all about scope. Every one of the global editing functions, when turning regular expressions on, scopes the amount of data that you're able to see um, based on the type of function that you're using. And so depending on how much data you need to see um, would depend, would decide which global editing function you're going to use um, or would be appropriate for the, um, the, the change that you're trying to make. And so we'll talk about scopes in regular expressions, uh, scopes in terms of the data that's uh, made accessible to a regular expression. Um, we'll look at some examples. I've pulled some questions that I've gotten so some real examples um, that we'll go through uh, and then um, take questions. Uh, I had made the offer to folks, if you have some examples that you're working on that you'd like to have either um, a representative example or the example that you're working on done during the session, um, go ahead and send them to me and we'll, we'll uh, if, I, if they look like they would be appropriate for the larger group or they uh, show a good 
um, uh, example of concept, we'll go ahead and you do use it during the session. Uh, but that's kind of the approach that I'm going to take for uh, the second part of this particular piece. Um, like I said, this is very quick. Um, uh, usually, it's, you do this over the course of a lot longer period um, and with lots of examples and um, having people write their own. Um, I would recommend uh, if you really want to work with uh, the .NET regular expression language um, that you spend some time um, in the uh, regular expression quick reference, reading the, the documentation that's here because it'll help um, walk you through um, how the regular expressions get applied, um, and then get familiar with the uh, regular um, expression tester here. Um, I find that it's a, a very good um, uh, way to um, just copy a record um, and start searching for information within it because you get to see right away how the data is being matched. Um, and when the data doesn't get matched, you, you get that feedback right away um, so that you can start understanding um, a little bit better how the expression language is working. And if things um, work differently here than in MarkEdit um, and it's not particularly new line related, you can ask and I can help you understand um, what are the options that are being applied within MarkEdit um, that uh, need to be um, set on this tool side to, uh, to completely replicate the functionality. So that's what I got. Um, so uh, if this is of interest, hopefully uh, I will see some folks um, uh, on, uh, on Friday and um, some good examples we can walk through. Uh, so that's that.